Welcome to a special International Petroleum Technology Conference webcast. Today's session is IPTC's Society Top Papers, Part 1. I am Ili Afifudin, and I am the Global Exploration and Appraisal Business Development Manager at Westwood Global Energy Group, and I will be your session chair. I would also like to introduce my co-chair, Shivaji Maitra, Director and Imaging Manager and Senior Geophysical Advisor at CGG Malaysia. Welcome to all of you, and we are very pleased to be here today as your session chairs. The IPTC Society Top Papers is a special session featuring top papers from the conference's four sponsoring societies, namely Association of Petroleum Geologists, AAPG, the European Association of Geoscientists and Engineers, EAGE, the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, SEG, and the Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE. Today, we will listen to three top papers from Arshad Reza, Richard Ford, and Ritam Biswas, and they will be presenting their papers on various industry topics. Before we continue, I would like to highlight that you will have an opportunity to have a Q&A session with the speakers. The live Q&A session will be held on Wednesday, 24th February from 2 p.m. UTC. You may start posing your questions today via the comment section. We will compile your questions to be addressed during the Q&A session on Wednesday, 24th February. Thank you. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Arshad Reza from University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore, to deliver his presentation on feasibility of limestone reservoirs as a carbon dioxide storage site, an experimental study. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to speak with all of you. This is Arshad Reza, associated with Petroleum and Gas Engineering Department, UT Lahore, Pakistan. I'm going to present the findings of my published AAPG paper titled as Feasibility of Limestone Reservoirs as a CO2 Storage Site and Experimental Study. American Association of Petroleum Geologists recently nominated this uh, published work of mine as a top paper for IPTC conference. The following contents will be covered during the presentation. Uh, first introduction we need to carry out this research and the adopted methodology and thereafter result and discussion will be carried out and uh, in the end conclusion will be made to address the issue of global warming posed by greenhouse gas emissions co2 sequestration has been considered as one of the most effective strategies Deep slime aquifers and depleted oil and gas reservoirs have been recognized as the most suitable CO2 storage sites worldwide. These mediums, which are mainly composed of sandstone and carbonate, carbonate rocks, but carbonate may exhibit a variety of different behaviors based on their geological age and mineral composition. In fact, carbonates are not easy to characterize because of their complex pore structures, microporosity, white degree of heterogeneity at different scales and high reactivity. In addition, supercritical CO2 injection in carbonates initiates a sequence of chemical reaction because of generation of an acidic environment at reservoir condition. Common fluid rock CO2 chemical reaction taking place in carbonates, which is a transport controlled reaction as expressed by equation 1. In this interaction, the dissolved bicarbonate species reacts with the divalent cations to precipitate carbonate minerals as discussed by equation 2 to 4. So, equation 1 is related to the dissolution and equation 2 to 4 are related to the precipitation. Formation of calcium, magnesium and iron carbonates are expected to be the primary means by which supercritical CO2 is immobilized in carbonate reservoirs. However, Carbon dioxide solution uh, expressed by equation 1 and precipitation expressed by equation 2 to 4 cannot occur simultaneously because they are controlled by pH. Faster chemical reactions in large pore spaces and reduce the strength of the reservoir rocks in the longer term. These chemical interactions may result in reservoir compaction and well bore integrity issues. Many studies have been carried out concerning supercritical CO2 reactivity in carbonates, where it was revealed that rock dissolution takes place upon supercritical CO2 injection. Uh, this, this, uh, the table on the slide 
present a summary of recent studies highlighting the influence of geochemical reaction on the mechanical characteristics of the carbonates. The study in 2008 analyzed the permeability changes at about the scale during the storage of a supercritical CO2 in carbonate formation located in southeastern Turkey. They considered different flow rates from 180 to 3600 milliliter per hour at different injection rates and uh, they <coughs> estimated the porosity and permeability. The result indicated that the changes were negligible. The study in 2013 investigated pore scale fluid rock interaction after supercritical CO2 injection into two carbonate samples while considering two phase flow it at typical storage conditions of 9 megapascal and 50 centigrade. However, they considered a very high supercritical CO2 injection rate of 60 milliliter per hour that uh, is very high com uh, um, among um, if we compare the injection rate that have been considered in all those studies present uh, reported in the table. And the result reported by Gerby in 2013 uh, confirmed the formation of highly conductive channels such as wormholes and significant increase in porosity and permeability of these samples. All these studies have uh, have considered different injection rate and uh, um, many studies have uh, been performed the experiments at a very high injection rates. The reason uh, to uh, that compelled us to carry out this research is that there are four trapping mechanisms that took place within a storage medium in which st structural trapping mechanism and the capital trapping, uh, dissolution trapping and the last one is mineral trapping. Capital trapping uh, is an effective trapping mechanism that took place in a very short term uh, period and is very sensitive to the low injection rate. So that was the reason in our mind to consider the low injection rate compatibility to see the uh, compatibility of the rock at a very, at a very low injection rate because uh, low injection rate is very favorable to consider uh, during the injection to achieve the to optimize the capital trapping. So uh, to date there have been several experimental studies concern, concerning the feasibility of carbonates and likelihood of mechanical failure in CO2 storage sites. However, their conclusions were drawn based only on a limited number of experiments in which the effect of supercritical CO2 injection rate was ignored. In this study, the feasibility of limestone is evaluated based on the injection rate and attempts were made to provide a deeper insight into the changes of physical and mechanical properties of carbonates once exposed to the supercritical CO2. So concern, uh, considering a consideration of low injection rate and uh, uh, a deep insight by performing a number of experiments to see the deeper insight was our aim to carry out this research. That has been ignored in the past. The Somniart limestone from eastern France was used in this study. This limestone is a heterogeneous rock with different uh, uh, <coughs> percentage of calcite and biotite based on the X-ray diffraction result obtained. The microstructure of the limestone as it appears in scanning uh, electronic microscopes, same images is complicated and characterized by introid pores, sediment inside the oil nuclei and palisadic cement line, interparticle pores and cements. Their petrophysical properties such as porosity were measured, porosity and permeability were measured before injection as given in table 1. A number of experiments uh, were performed uh, to achieve the objectives uh, core flooding, scanning, electronic microscope, uh, CT scan, ultrasonic pulse measurement, NMR test, and unconfined compression test. However, uh, the standard Experimental protocols were followed and uh, specific conditions were considered that can be seen in a published AAPG paper. However, the point to mention uh, uh, regarding the flow rate is that we considered a flow rate of 0.4 milliliter per hour uh, for CO2 injection. This was very low injection rate uh, that was chosen compared to the other studies to assess the dependency of chemical reactivity at low injection rate. Uh, because it was uh, known that carbonates have a high reactivity when injection rate goes above 60 milliliter per hour as shown by uh, some authors and um, in the past.
During the flooding, the inlet and outlet pressures of the core holder were monitored because the magnitude of the pressure drop across the sample could represent the formation injectivity. <clears throat> if injection is made at constant flow rate, uh, the figure on the left hand side uh, 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 between differential pressure and time shows the uh, in the sample that there was a two phase flow during the supercritical CO2 injection in the brine saturated samples. More than 60%, 65% of the pressure drop was induced by the brine instead of supercritical CO2, which might be linked to the hydrogenity of the sample or surface or matrix dissolution. In fact, clear signs of surface and matrix dissolution were observed in the sample after saturation, as can be seen in Figure 3. <clears throat> uh, sam in CT scan images of limestone samples before and after CO2 injection, respectively, uh, give a clear indication that there is a green dissolution, green breakage, green loss, and cement dissolution after CO2 flooding. Creation of warm holes and breakage of skeleton were also observed in the CT scan images of the sample. It appeared that limestone may also may lose its integrity when exposed to supercritical CO2 and significant mechani mechanical failure might be induced in the carbonate reservoir chosen for CCS project. Uh, to have further confirmation, uh, attempts were made to measure the porosity and geomechanical properties of the samples through the ultrasonic pulse measurements, uh, uniaxial compression test, and NMR tests. Figure 6 shows uh, changes in the primary and shear wave velocity during brine and supercritical CO2 flooding, as can be seen in figure that brine saturated sample gives a higher uh, primary wave velocity compared to the uh, uh, velocity when the uh, sample is saturated by CO2. Uh, however, the trend of uh, 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 shear wave velocity in the brine saturated and supercritical CO2 sat saturated samples are similar but less than the P waves. This could be partially caused by the lower density of supercritical CO2 compared with the brine with the changes in the primary wave velocity after reaching the pore pressure of 10 megapascal. However, However, it can be linked to the damage of the solid skeleton of the sample. This was further confirmed by the estimation of dynamic bulk modulus of the sample before and after flooding. Bulk modulus, uh, we know that, has an inverse relationship with the compressibility of the solid framework. It seems that likelihood of compaction in the sample is very high once supercritical CO2 in, is injected, and it is clearly evident that uh, there is a uh, double decrease in the bulk modulus. Obtained from the NMR analysis indicate that porosity of the limestone sample has decreased 3 to 4 percent, whereas due to time range was shifted to the right. Perhaps because of the creation of small pores, this slight decrease in the porosity could be linked to the dissolution of calcite, which was transported from the injection sites and blocked the pore space downstream. Similar observations were made. Uh, once changes in the static elastic parameters were recorded through the mechanical test on the samples before and after supercritical CO2 injection, as reported in Table 3. Uh, in fact, it appears that static bulk modulus can be reduced by as much as 50% after the flooding, pushing the carbonate reservoir to further the compaction once the overburden stress becomes huge in deep geological formation. In the study, limestone samples were analyzed before and after supercritical CO2 injection in terms of injectivity as well as mineralogical, petrophysical, and mechanical degradation at a low injection rate. Result obtained, and we concluded that there is a continuous decrease of injectivity in the sample because of the dissolution and precipitation of the calcite in the rock matrix. And we also found that limestone sample integrity is also sensitive to the low injection rate, uh, like it appears uh, to be sensitive to the rate of injection because similar interaction and loss of matrix integrity were reported in earlier studies in which the high injection rate of CO2 was used. Elastic and strength properties of the sample were also decreased after injection because of the increase of porosity and matrix dissolution. For more details on the two days presentation, you can go through the published paper. I am really grateful to Curtin University for providing the experimental facilities. I am also thankful to American Association of Petroleum Geologists to nominate my study for IPTC as a top paper. Special thanks goes to IPTC 
for the complement registration and to facilitate this process. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Ashwad, for the great presentation. Next, we would like to invite Richard Ford from Western GCO to deliver his presentation on fast turnaround OBS, time lapse processing enabled by up down deconvolution, a North Sea case study. Over to you, Richard. Hello everyone, I'm Richard Ford, a geophysicist with Schlumberger, and my talk will be covering fast turnaround time-lapse ocean bottom seismic processing enabled by up-down deconvolution. Now, a version of this talk was given at the SEG annual in 2019, uh, but has somewhat evolved given the uh, shortest time to present, and has a slight different spin to it, providing more of an overview than something with technical depth and an additional focus on project turnaround. Hope you enjoy the talk. To start, I'd like to discuss the motivation behind developing our workflow. The industry is continually seeking efficiencies to both increase value and reduce cost, with our particular challenge being how we can produce the same high resolution image in a shorter time. For 4D surveys, it's particularly important because for every infill drilling decision made without information from the current monitor survey devalues the processing product. We should be enabling closer to real-time analysis of the reservoir to encourage proactive rather than reactive drilling decisions. In addition, improved efficiencies in the 4D processing workflow can enable more 4D surveys to take place, so twice a year compared to just the once. Here we show how we use up-down deconvolution as a driver in reducing turnaround time. The Ever Greek survey, the case study for this presentation, is located in the Atsira High of the Norwegian North Sea. Two vintages of 4D data were acquired in 2016 and in 2018. And in this time, there were two good years of production, so we did expect a strong 4D signal. In terms of acquisition, it was ocean bottom cable for both. And as for geometry, it was relatively standard for what we see in the North Sea. A shot carpet of 25 meters in the inline by 50 meters in the cross line. And a receiver patch of 25 meters in the inline by 200 meters in the cross line. The receiver patch covering an area of 78 km squared. The water bottom, generally an important parameter for up down decon, gently varies around 100 meters across the survey, plus or minus 5 meters, so we can consider this relatively flat. And now on to up down deconvolution. When we look at conventional processing, we can say it requires targeted processes to remove non primary energy components of the recorded signal. And here on the left, you can see the source ghost, the source side multiples, and on the right, the receiver side goes to multiple. Each of these elements is interfering with the upgoading primary energy that we want to keep. And each are targeted individually by the processes of the conventional loop. And here you can see them removed. Updown deconvolution is a novel process that attenuates all of this energy in one step. And as both wave fields contain the source signature and its ghost, the updown deconvolution has a multi dimensional designature effect with the option to output the data with your desired wavelength. To summarize the workflow, we have our hydrophone and vertical geophone. We calibrate the vertical geophone to the hydrophone, and the data being in the receiver domain is interpolated to a fine shot carpet from the acquisition geometry, and then input into a finely sampled tabby Q transform. We then separate into up and down going wave fields, and then perform up down deconvolution which is the spectral division of the upgoing and downgoing wave fields. We then come out of tabby Q space uh, to acquisition geometry, but not actually acquisition geometry. We actually go back to co-located shots for the two vintages of data. Here is an outline of the conventional 4D workflow. It can be summarized into a number of steps, including pre-processing a D-spike, pre-processing of things such as reading the data and trace edits, and then we have three main groups of processes, so noise removal, the multiple, and migration. And each can then be subdivided into many different processes. It really is a lot of steps, and the 3D and 4D QC of the individual steps continually adds time to a production project. With the up-down deconvolution flow, however, we simplify it to this. We still have our upfront pre-processing and despike, but we concatenate all of our denoise and demultiple into the up-down deconvolution flow. 
Now, this is a viable thing to do as there is a lot of energy or noise that can be considered water column energy that is removed with uptime deconvolution. And there is also the option of applying a tau BQ mute while in that domain to remove residual dipping energy. The migration sequence was also shortened as we go straight from the receiver domain to the image domain using reverse time migration. Overall, this shortened sequence this shortened sequence led to interpretable time lapse volumes within just 10 days of last shot point. And this is a significant reduction in turnaround time, especially compared to the conventional. Before discussing more about aspects of the turnaround time, I'd like to touch upon some workflow assumptions. I've done deconvolution is 4D friendly, and one example is that it accounts for water column variability due to both the datuming and the water column being the same in the upgoing and downgoing. And here you can see an example on the right. So here we have 4D time shifts uh, for the conventional at the top and upturned convolution at the bottom. And on the conventional after the multiple, you can still see some residual sail line static uh, time shifts uh, that are just not present on the upturned deconvolution data. It is robust and parameterized correctly. You are putting your full data through a transform and pulling it back out. It requires adequate spatial and temporal sampling for interpolation and the tau pq transform to be robust. It does require a 1D water layer, such as what we have for the Alfred Creek field. We can say that the up-down deconvolution is less sensitive to 3D effects of the subsurface compared to the seabed, as evidenced by the results that will be shown, and also many published examples. And lastly, no data subtraction to deal with. It's a process that can be highly subjective, especially for shallow to medium water layers, where we have overlapping low frequency primary and multiple events and can potentially be harmful to your time lapse data if overdone. And now I want to discuss how we achieve the 10 day delivery because while lockdown deconvolution and the reduced processing workflow is a factor, it's just one part of an array of things that led to the successful delivery time. There's so much going on in this slide and so many extra details that it could easily be split off into a, a separate talk altogether. So first up, we have the geophysical understanding, and we did have previous survey experience, uh, which was obviously helpful. We had a good understanding of the acquisition geometry and the survey history. And we also stress tested the impact of noise through the up-down deconvolution workflow and the impact on the time-lapse signal. And of course, we must mention the value of robust project management. We had a project manager who was a dedicated point of contact for both, both acquisition, vessel, and client. Who was in charge of resourcing and kept the project to a strict timeline. Offshore communication was another vital factor. We had real-time CoQC with the onboard processors and were able to rapidly identify any potential acquisition problems uh, leading to reshoots. And finally, efficiency and infrastructure. We had planned and standardized QCs going through the time-lapse workflow. And we were able to actually process a significant amount of the baseline survey before the monitor was delivered. And with such a large amount of data, which is typical of ocean bottom surveys, it was important to have a large compute capacity and compute infrastructure in place, as well as making sure the workflows were suitably optimized. And now onto a, a data example. On the left is a receiver gather uh, from the hydrophone data, and I've highlighted the first water bottom multiple and that same water bottom, water bottom multiple is highlighted on the CMP stack, which is split into different frequencies. And you can also see that we have quite a strong reverberating multiple propagating down into the data. After up-down de deconvolution, this multiple is well attenuated, as you can see on the receiver gather and the CMP stack, and all of that reverberating energy is well removed. Low frequencies are boosted through deghosting, and the output is zero phase and there's very good continu continuity of the target layer across the frequencies. On to some attribute results of the time-lapse survey. To the left we have a peak amplitude extraction over the reservoir interval that captures the main 4D differences between 2016 and 2018. There's a nice strong signal at the well location where we have water injection followed by the water flood and production at the producing mass. On the right, we have uh, 4D metrics, so NOMS at the top and predictability at the bottom. Uh, for NOMS, it peaks at 6, which is very low, especially for an ocean bottom survey, which tends to be a bit noisier 
um, than ToadStreamer and is very comparable to other types of measurement such as VSP. At the bottom we have a predictability which peaks at close to 100 which is also very good and do remember this data hasn't been through any kind of traditional noise attenuation sequence and we still re achieved excellent metrics. We process this data twice, once through the fast turnaround route and the other through the conventional processing which finished some months after. So we had a nice direct comparison of the two. And despite the different workflows, the same 4D interpretation of the two data sets can be made, the main difference being the timeline. The comparison of the two finalized versions led to the preference being overall for the up-down deconvolution flow. And as such, all future surveys will be processed using this, uh, the up-down deconvolution route. To conclude, we have a new robust workflow for ocean bottom seismic 4D data for shallow to medium water depths. We've produced high quality and comparable 4D results compared to the conventional processing route. It enables iterative processing, which, because it's so fast, makes processing almost like moving through the iterations of tomography for velocity model building. So it's a continuous improvement approach, if you like. Shear noise on the geophone is one example I haven't mentioned. It's not attenuated in the sequence, and if it's strong, it does require a focused approach. That and addressing other types of noise in detail could be another iteration. Interbeds is another good example which uh, could be an iteration three um, and actually just a point about interbeds because we aren't performing any kind of adaptive subtraction of multiple models um, that can potentially harm the interbed multiples we are able to better model and subtract them as a separate process to finalize the talk we firmly be believe we achieved record-breaking turnaround time delivering an interpretable 40 result just 10 days after last shot point and this was kind of un unbelievable and, and there were a lot of questions about this time. However, we just processed the 2020 vintage of Edward Greek and that also went through the up down deconvolution route. The 10 day target for that was surpassed with delivery time reduced to just seven days. On that note, I'd like to thank Slumberjay, Linden Energy and Partners in the PL338 for permission to publish this work and also my co-authors. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Ritham Biswas from BP to deliver his presentation on density inversion from seismic using a transdimensional approach, a field data set example. Thank you and over to you, Ritham. Hello everyone, my name is Ritam Bishwas and today I will present our work on density inversion using AVO seismic gather and here we have used a stochastic transdimensional approach and applied it on a field data example from Trinidad. My co-authors are Dhananjay Kumar from BP, Miral Kesain from University of Texas at Austin, uh, Akal Paul and Katrina Pecker from BP. So this work was done as a collaboration between BP and University of Texas at Austin. The content of my presentation is as follows. First, I will discuss the motivation behind this method and then discuss the method itself and finally show its results on a synthetic data example and also on a real data example from Trinidad and finally discuss the conclusions. Now the question arises, why density? In general, we assume a linear relationship between density and the velocity. However, in the case of a gas reservoir, this relationship breaks down. Here in this picture, uh, this is the paleo residual gas zone with a gas saturation of less than 10% and this is a full gas reservoir zone. If we look at the P and S wave velocity, there is not much of difference. However, density shows a much drop at the gas reservoir. Therefore, density helps uh, in identifying the potential reservoir and differentiate economic from the uneconomic reservoir. This slide shows a conventionally used flowchart for seismic modeling and inversion. We started with the reservoir properties, V shale, phi water saturation, and then using the rock physics, calculate the VP, VS, and density. And then using the AVO modeling, we calculate the synthetic seismogram, which is then compared with the observed seismic gathers. And error is calculated. Then we update our model and keep on repeating this process till the time our error is in the tolerable limit. 
In our case, we have used a stochastic based approach for inversion and in the next slide we will discuss its reason. So the motivation of this work comes from the fact that geophysical problems are quite non-unique in nature. That is what we expect an error function something like this which is quite pointed and just having one minima. But because of the incomplete physics, lack of observation and bad choices in inversion, what we have is that there are multiple solutions, that is there are several local solutions and also the global solution is not pointed, it's quite flat and we, need, and we need to estimate all the model from this region to have a good model estimate. So a error function for a model having just one variable looks something like this. So there are several local minima and this is the global minima. But for a two variable, it represents a surface. So these are the different local minima and this is the global minima. And we can imagine how complex the error function can become uh, when it moves to a higher and higher number of variables. So what is the one thing in an inverse problem we know the least about? It is the model dimension. By model dimension, I mean the number of model parameters. So before moving forward, I will introduce the Bayesian framework. We can represent any inverse problem in the form of a base rule where we want to sample from the posterior distribution which is given as the product of the prior and the likelihood. This can be pictorically represented as this where set A is the set of all the possible models which satisfy our prior knowledge and the set B is the set of all possible models which satisfy the data and we want to sample from the intersection of these two set which represents our posterior distribution. Now we cannot sample directly from the posterior distribution because it will require an exhaustive calculation of this denominator part uh, which is not possible. So how do we draw samples from the PPD? We generally use a Markov chain Monte Carlo type of method. Here we have used a recently developed method called reversible jump Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. The proposed sampling is a combination of reversible jump Markov chain Monte Carlo and Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Here we try to tap in the best characteristics of the two methods. The first part is the RGMCMC step, which helps in the transdimensional sampling. Here we use a modified base rule, where this is the posterior distribution from where we want to sample the model. And this can be given as the product of the prior, which consists of two terms. First is the prior for the number of model parameter k. And second is the prior on the model m given k number of model parameter. And this is the likelihood. Here we start with a model M uh, having k number of model parameter and sample a new model M dash having k dash number of model parameter. However, RGM sensor can be slow because it tries to sample from a variable dimensional model space and might need many, many iterations to converge. Therefore, we use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo for the second part. The Hamiltonian Monte Carlo uses gradient information to reach to the target distribution very quickly. Here in this picture, which represents a sample posterior distribution, here the yellow region represents the higher probability region or the target distribution from where we want to sample. Here we start with a random location from this location and using the gradient information, we can see that in just two, two steps, it could reach the target distribution and start the sampling from there. Here we use the acceptance ratio to accept a new model, which is derived in the Sane and Bissos 2017, which takes into account a combination of the both the two steps. So this is the typical flowchart of this method, where we start with the starting model M having k number of model parameter, which is drawn from a prior distribution. Then uh, we do a transdimensional sampling, where uh, there can be two steps. In the first step, we might increase the number of model parameter that is k dash greater than k. And on the other hand, uh, in uh, on the other hand, we can decrease the number of model parameter that is k dash less than k. This is also known as the death step. And when we increase the number of model parameter, it is known as the birth step. So in the birth step, first we perform the birth step and then the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo step. But in the death step, first we perform the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo step, then the death step. This is just to maintain the uh, reversibility of the chain. And then we accept this new model uh, with this acceptance ratio and update our current uh, model if this new model is accepted. Or otherwise, we keep the old model and we keep on sampling till the time we have 
reach the target distribution as well as we have enough sample to represent our posterior distribution. Now we will discuss the parameterization of the model space for our 1D inversion problem. We have considered horizontally earth layers where our model M has k number of layers and S is the depth time location of the layers. And for every layer there is a VP, VS and density value attached to it. Here we have, uh, here we can change the number of layers as well as during the inversion also solve for the number of layers along with their elastic parameter. In this example, we have total three layers and Z1, Z2, Z3 represents the depth time location of those layers. And for every layer, there is a VP, VS and density. For our synthetic case, we developed two model, model one and model two. Model 1 can be compared to a paleo residual gas reservoir zone and model 2 as full gas reservoir zone in this small region where we have uh, inserted gas and you can see that for VP there is not much of change but for density there is a lot of change and we have used the 2D elastic finite difference to generate synthetic gathers. This slide shows the inverted result for VP and density for model 1 and the model 2. Here the green represents the true model, red represents the mean model, magenta 95% confidence interval bounds and the brown is the starting model. We use the model 1 for building our starting model and model 2 is the blind well. Looking at the result for both the model 1 and the model 2, the inverted results have fairly well estimated the VP and the density. Now we try to analyze if we were able to identify and differentiate PRG from the full gas saturation. Again, the model 1 has the PRG which is in black and the model 2 which has the full gas saturation, it is in red. So this is the plot for the PV velocity. So this is the true model plot for the PV velocity and this is the estimated model plot. For the PV velocity, there is not much of change in the PRG and the full gas saturation. However, if we look at the density, so this is the plot for the true uh, mod density model and this is the estimated density model. Uh, there is a lot of change in the PRG in the full gas situation for the true model and which we can see also see in the estimated density model. There is, uh, uh, there is a drop in density. So thus we can conclude that our method is able to predict and distinguish PRG from the full gas saturation zones. Now we move on to the real data example from Trinidad. Here we have total three angle stacks at 10 degree, 20 degree and 35 degree angle. And there are total two wells. We have used the first well for the well tie as well as generating the wavelet uh, at near, mid and far angle stacks as well as creating the starting model. There are total 501 inline and 901 cross lines. This two cube represents the inverted mean model for the VP and the density for all the CDPs. Now we compare our inverted model for VP and the density at well 2, which is the blind well. Here the red represents the well log, the blue represents the mean model and the dotted blue represents the 95% confidence interval bound. Looking at them, we can see that the inverted model quite well match the well log and are mostly within the 95% confidence interval bound. Now we compare one of the conventional attributes along with the estimated density for an extracted horizon. The color scale has been modified such that more red represents higher gas saturation. Looking at the well 2 which is known to have PRG, conventional attribute shows red color. However, our inverted density is much more in a lighter color. Also at the well 1 which is, which has, which is the pay, the conventional attribute shows blue but our inverted density shows in red color. With this, I would like to conclude that the density is a good proxy to identify the PRG from full gas saturation. However, it requires a good data quality as well as the data should have a good sensitivity towards density. The transdimensional seismic inversion using Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo can be made a practical tool for routine seismic data analysis. And here we demonstrated uh, example of 1D pre-stack inversion considering layer earth model. With this, I would like to acknowledge BP for collaboration and funding the project as well as providing the HPC resources, UT Austin for all the support during my thesis and thank SET and IPTC for providing the platform for showing my work and thank you. 
Thank you to all the speakers for their insightful presentation. We hope you have enjoyed the session. Please remember, we will have the live Q&A session on 24th of February at 2 p.m. UTC, UTC plus 8, streaming live across IPTC's social media channels. In the meantime, please visit 2021.iptcnet.org to find out more about IPTC and more information. Thank you.